And as you can see today, we have the opportunity to listen to him talking in regards to diabetes. So with that, I will pass it over to Dr. Bauer. Thank you. In uh, 1995, uh, Canada adopted its dietary recommendations. And Canadians are known to be good followers. So the majority of Canadians follow those dietary uh, guidelines. But as we learned on cancer, that uh, cancer has a higher statistical uh, uh, cause of death in cancer than the United States. And also, diabetes. So that is telling us we need to maybe um, adopt a better dietary guidelines. You need to improve on what is the minimum suggestion. Uh, because it's not helping. There are some movements trying to change uh, those dietary guidelines because they're, they're fairly old, you know, and it's not helping that much. So maybe uh, you can take this on yourself. So we're going to look at diabetes, and diabetes is really an epidemic. And it's primarily the type two diabetes. So type two diabetes, it used to be called adult onset. There was juvenile onset and adult onset. Juvenile diabetes now is called type one. Adult onset is type two. So adult onset diabetes is, is lifestyle. This, that's why it's, it's adult onset. So your lifestyle has um, affected your system so that you now have diabetes. These guidelines, again, these eight laws of health are your answer to the problem. Nutrition is the number one. Um, uh, diet and exercise basically, so nutrition and exercise are the two primary factors that cause death. So an improvement on your exercise and on your diet is going to have a huge factor. Diabetes is the same way. But even sunshine, did you know a 20 minute exposure to sun, that means taking a sun bath so in a private area where you're in your swimsuit or something like that and exposing yourself for 20 minutes will lower your blood sugar by 7%. Now if you add exercise to that, you can lower it considerably. So all of these laws have a, a effect upon you. Do you remember the, um, the need for the complex carbohydrates? So a simple carbohydrate uh, and a complex carbohydrate. What is a complex carbohydrate? Simply, it is a whole product, okay? As you simplify it, you refine it. So we could take cane sugar. Well, if you went out there and grabbed a, uh, a cane stalk and came back and peeled it a little bit and started chewing on it, you'd be chewing on a complex carbohydrate, okay? But when we bring it back and we juice it and we boil it down and we let it sit and let the molasses fall to the bottom and take the molasses off, we no longer have a brown sugar. We're now heading toward a white. And then we went and we, we uh, make charcoal out of bones from the slaughterhouse and then we uh, bleach it and uh, we filter it and we take the albinum from the blood of the animals and we use it as a filter to filter it out. And eventually we end up with a chemical called sucrose. That's from cane sugar and that's as simple as you could get. That's a simple carbohydrate. 
So we do that with white rice. We do that with, uh, which used to be brown rice. Uh, we do that with uh, uh, wheat and we make white flour. Those are taking what would be complex carbohydrates and making them into simple. So we need com uh, complex carbohydrates. They are not your problem if you're a diabetic. Fruit is not your problem, okay? People always say, well, what about fruit? I thought it's high in sugar. Well, fruit is not your problem, okay? It's, uh, it's that thing you get at the end of the meal that you've taken in this, and taken your fruit and refined it and put sugar in it and then put it in a cake and then you're sitting down to eat it. Now that's your problem, okay? So they are, they are what your body wants. They are 100% they are efficient, okay? So they're the perfect food for your body. Um, these are, again, the essential elements of proper nutrition. Okay, you have to have majority of complex carbohydrates. That should be, um, as uh, Dr. Garman has suggested, they, increasing your uh, servings a day. Well, I, um, all my servings a day are <laughs> complex carbohydrates, but, you know, get your fruits and vegetables up to at least 10 times a day, uh, 10 servings. Um, you need uh, uh, a little bit of fats, and you get it in everything you eat. Uh, so, you know, some seeds, some nuts, those things. Uh, protein, protein's in everything, okay? Protein comes from plants. Even lettuce has protein. Even watermelon has protein. Oranges have protein. Everything has protein in it. The last thing you have to worry about is where you're going to get your protein. You might have to concern yourself is how much you're getting. Okay, we need vitamins, we need minerals, and we need water, okay? Again, the ideal diet, and then here's the SAD diet. That's the standard American diet, the SAD diet. Okay, I just want to know if you got it, it's a pun, you know. <laughs> Anyways, the ideal diet is 1 to 25% fat, 75% unsaturated, 5% protein, 70 to 90% unrefined carbohydrates, mostly complex, and then over here that sad diet, uh, 20 to 35 percent fat, 80 to 90 percent of that saturated, 10 to 35 percent protein, um, 45 to 65 percent carbohydrates, mostly refined, and 11 percent sugar. Those are the stats actually for Canada. Um, so that's the sad diet for Canada. You need those carbohydrates because they are your sources for your brain, your central nervous system, and your muscles. They come from plants. Half the calories is fat. Sugar and starches are carbohydrates. So, this diabetic epidemic. Diabetes in Canada. 3,539 diagnosed cases in 2018. Estimated 7,217,000 uh, pediatric and un, or pre diabetic and undiagnosed. Many people have high blood sugar, but they don't go to the doctor. They don't get it diagnosed. So, twice as many. Uh, direct cost of health care system in Canada $3.6 billion. Think it's a problem? Seems to be. Um, the afflictions of diabetes. Reduced lifespan from five to 15 years. Three times more likely to be hospitalized with cardiovascular disease. What we talked about the first night. Your risks go way up when you have diabetes. 12 times more likely to be hospitalized with end-stage renal disease. Yeah, most, 50% uh, 50 um, 50 of all people that are on dialysis are diabetics. So your kidneys are going to fail. 20 times more likely to be hospitalized for a lower limb amputation. contributes to 30% of strokes, 
40% of heart attacks, 50% of kidney failures, 70% of the amputations. Pretty much if you go to a diabetic and you have a problem, uh, someone was telling me uh, just recently of an experience they had, they are diabetic, and they had gone to the doctor and the, the foot was inflamed, looked like it was inflamed. Well, right away they're talking about amputation. Well, it actually was a skin irritation. So just the fact that you're a diabetic and there's something wrong, they're thinking amputation. So uh, depressive symptoms, uh, about 30% higher. Risk of blindness, up to 25% uh, times higher. Um, these are all statistics for Canada, by the way. Uh, diabetic retinopathy affects 500,000 Canadians. That's, that's uh, the uh, problem with the eyes. And eventually you'll go blind. Listen to this now, whoops, yeah. So either transplant or death. And what do they have? Early stages of cirrhosis of the liver. So are all, what, is, what do we usually associate cirrhosis of the liver with? Alcoholic. So are all these, all these kids alcoholics? No. Ah, what is it? It's fat. It's all the fast foods. It's these fatty foods. It, uh, it's causing uh, 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 severe liver difficulties. Now, number 10 cause of death in Canada is cirrhosis of the liver. This is the 10th. Now, is there that many alcoholics in Canada? Ah, or has our diet got extremely fatty? Are we eating those french fries? Are we getting those hamburgers? Are we buying all that junk food from the store that's full of fat? Okay, it's getting us. And diabetes is, is uh, it's, it's cause too. Again, there is no higher calorie content of anything than fat. It is the highest. It's nine calories per gram. Protein and carbohydrates are four calories per gram. Oil is 4,000 calories per pound. Broccoli is 128 calories per pound. So one tablespoon of any oil is 120 calories. So here's a study with, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, this was, uh, I believe, in 2000. It said some uh, populations are at higher risk of type 2 diabetes, um, well this is Canada actually, such as those of South Asian, Asian African, Hispanic, in, uh, indigenous uh, descent, those who are overweight, older and have low income. Diabetes rates are three to five times higher in First Nation populations. This is the one from Los Angeles, 2004. And they were looking at the children because the um, Hispanic children are known to be uh, more obese 
um, than other children. So they were kind of looking at them and found that three out of 10 had early stages of diabetes and heart disease. That's not a good thing. That's not a good thing. Here's a very interesting study since, uh, uh, of the, some native people. These are the Zuni land Indians. I believe they're in New Mexico, I believe is uh, where these are from. And uh, 50 years ago, it says, a half century ago, uh, diabetes was virtually unknown among them, okay? Um, but then three things came in. Processed foods, TV, and cars. Now, 50% of the Zunis over age 49 have diabetes. And how many years? 50 years. Went from virtually none to 50%. What was it? Let me hear it. Processed foods, TV, and cars. Yeah. So they used to walk to the store. Okay? Now, instead of walking to the store, they hop in the car and drive there. They buy some processed food. They go back home. They used to, you know, they used to farm out of the, they used to have a garden. I don't know how many people here have a garden. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. A third of you have a garden. Okay. It's interesting. I live in, I live in, I live at the end of a road in the country in our, in, in uh, Tennessee. Okay. Nobody at the end of our road. Now, when you, you see very few homes even driving out to where I live. I virtually, I think I see, in 30 miles, I see two gardens. Now, because we're living now for processed food, okay? So, processed food, cars, no exercise, and TV. Yeah. One in seven Canadians uh, self-identifies as a South Asian, Black, Chinese, uh, Latin American, Southeast Asian. These groups are at a greater risk of developing type 2 diabetes than the general population. Canada is uh, also home to over 1.4 million uh, uh, indigenous people who face significantly higher rates of diabetes and suffer more health consequences than the overall population. So if you find yourself in these uh, statistics, you need to be more concerned. So Canadians are aging. It's interesting. In, in the United States, or your health care system, our health care system is different, but uh, we're they're, they're being, um, I'd say, uh, I think like 65% health care costs in the United States is those ages 65 and older, okay? But in, in a very short time, I think by 2025, the uh, population of that age is to double. What's that going to do to the health care system? The same thing is happening to Canada. Um, the number of adults age 65 uh, years and older exceeds the number of children. Risk of developing type 2 diabetes uh, increases with age. Canadian has higher rates of many modifiable risk factors that contribute to the growing prevalence of type 2 diabetes. 46% of Canadian adults are physically inactive. So what is physically inactive? That's doing 30, uh, less than 30 minutes exercise besides your work. So, so if you're a homemaker and you, you, know, you, you walk out in the garden and, or, and then you come in, if you have a garden, and you, you cook and you um, clean the house, but you don't do 30 minutes excess exercise, then you are inactive. Same thing with anybody um, in their work, more than their work. It's really suggested an hour a day. Didn't need this before when we lived off the garden, we lived on the farm and, and uh, all of our activity, most of our activity was outside. 
Now, there are some, uh, if you're a logger <laughs> and you're going to spend all day walking up and down uh, the hills and cutting trees and so forth, that you don't need 30 minutes more exercise. But that's very few of us, okay? So if you're in a physical uh, environment, um, you know, you're hauling walls and hauling two by fours and you're doing that, then you don't need more. But that's not us in general. 60% are not eating enough fruits and vegetables. What do you think? Is that you? Are you eating enough fruits and vegetables or are you eating mostly uh, processed foods? 35% adults uh, and 19% of youth are overweight. So do you know what your weight should be? We have the BMI, right, body mass index. We have ways of uh, seeing what our weight should be. What do you think? If you're right now honestly uh, thinking to yourself, are you overweight? Okay, and then you need to do, you need to step up and do something about it. It's not something that's gonna go away on its own. You have to initiate some change in lifestyle. 18% of the population smokes tobacco. I hope that's not you. If, if uh, it is and you need some help, we, we help people. We help people quit smoking. Some people have smoked for 30 years, we've helped them. So it's, it can be done and uh, it's an insidious poison. It does a tremendous um, uh, death to the body. So here's uh, diabetes prevalence um, in uh, OECD countries versus Canada. You can see that Canada is number two. Um, here are some of the risk factors uh, in relating to these countries and Canada. As you can see that uh, uh, obesity, um, Canada's way down. Um, uh, diet, Canada's way down. Moderate or physical exercise, um, Canada's down again. So, these are not good statistics. We need to improve that. Canada's a good place to be. It's a nice country. Got beautiful land and so forth. Um, looks like a lot of opportunities, but we need to get a grip on our health. So exercise. Simple all exercise. Now, does it have to be you're going to go out there and just run for 15 miles every day or something? No. Um, so there's a numerous studies show that exercise can be both uh, prevent and reduce type 2, prevent and uh, reduce type 2 diabetes. Uh, this one is from Germany. Uh, 1996, the increased physical activity delays the onset of non-insulin dependent diabetes, which is type 2 diabetes, or even prevents the disease in 50% of susceptible individuals. How many? Half of them, half of them. Just what? Physical, increased physical activity. Hey, this is something you can do. Man, another... Uh, wake up 30 minutes earlier, go to bed 30 minutes earlier, and wake up 30 minutes earlier and get some exercise in. Um, from uh, the Medical College in South Carolina in 1998, uh, in the study about 1,500 men and women, researchers found that people who exercise even moderately. So what would be moderate exercise? Walking. Yeah, walking. Um, and your real goal is to, to get it until you are, you're sweating, till you're getting a good breath, breathing pretty good. But even the moderate exercises, if you're working your way up to that, is going to help, okay? Um, uh, it helped them metabolize their food. We've had individuals that we, they lowered their blood sugar by one, well, I, I say 100 points, but I don't know how to uh, relate that to your readings here. Like we go by points, like um, blood sugar there should be 90 or below. Here on your blood sugar uh, meters, I think it's like, was it five and a half is normal? Six and a half. Six and a half, okay. Eight. Eight wouldn't be normal, would it? No. What's normal? 4.5? Okay, 4.5 is normal. Well, that would be 90. It's a fasting sugar. That would be 90, under 90 um, in our country. So, um, 
we've had them lower uh, uh, probably uh, t uh, two numbers on your reading by just walking. Just going out, they had sugar was high, and so instead of taking something, we have them go out and just go for a good walk. They come back, they're, they're sweating, you know, they've been out in the sunshine, fresh air. Just lower the sugar. That's, uh, the sugar's there to be burned. It's fuel. But if you're not exercising, then the body has to do something with that. So that's where uh, insulin comes in. So result of blood sugar control and type 1 diabetes. Now type 1 diabetes is a failure of the pancreas. Okay? And uh, that is um, your system. It's an autoimmune disease, as mentioned, Dr. Garman has mentioned that uh, your system attacks its own pancreas and, um, and an infection and then the pancreas fails. And uh, so even with type 1 diabetes, 76% reduction in diabetic retinopathy, again the problem with the eyes, 54% reduction in significant kidney disease, and 60% reduction in peripheral neuropathy. And what they did is they just controlled their diet. You know, I was talking to a diabetic, and uh, they had gone to the doctor, and I was, I was telling them, you know, you need to, uh, the doc, I, 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 can't, I can only speak about the physicians in the United States, and again, not the ones that are God-fearing, but the general uh, population of physicians, they are not concerned so much about your health, they're concerned about how you think you feel. So they just want to make you happy in whatever lifestyle you've chosen. So they, do, they really don't want to step in and interfere with your lifestyle. So this diabetic was telling me she had gone to the doctor and the nurse offered her a piece of candy. And she says, well, I'm a diabetic. And she says, well, aren't you taking insulin? So if you want to eat candy, just take a little more insulin. See, they don't want to interfere with your lifestyle. But uh, that, that artificial insulin is not supposed to be in your system. So you can. Um, decrease uh, a, a lot of this just by getting a hold, even if you have type 1 diabetes, by getting a hold of your diet and exercise. Here is uh, an example of blood sugar. So um, we're going to take an a organic apple, okay? I like organic. So we're going to take an organic apple and we're going to eat it. As you can see, the peak blood sugar is about 30 minutes in after eating it. Now, your body's going to produce some insulin to handle that blood sugar, okay? So it's going to come down to a normal level. That would be that top level where it says apple, okay? It's going to come down and balance out, right? Then that's what insulin's for. It's to take, you know, when you eat, you're going to increase your blood sugar, and then it's going to bring it down and balance it out so you have a good um, reaction, all right? But then we could take that same apple and make it into applesauce, and now what do you see? We're still producing the same amount of insulin to handle that blood sugar, but what happens to that blood sugar? It goes lower, doesn't it? Okay. And then peaks up, this little peak up in the end, this, um, just where, under where it says applesauce, it starts peaking back up. Well, that is where your, bo your body says, well, wait a minute, the blood sugar's a little too low. So the glucose transfer system is kicked in, so your stored sugars are put back into the bloodstream, okay? Now, when we take that same apple and make apple juice, what happens to the blood sugar? Woo, drops way down, that's called hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Now you're irritable, you're angry, you don't feel well, and the body says, oh, this isn't right, so it jumps in and puts, uh, kicks that uh, glucose transfer system in and picks the blood sugar back up. You keep doing this, if you keep doing this, you're going to wear your system out and you're going to end up with type 2 diabetes. Your cells are going to get insulin resistant, your pancreas is going to get weak, and so on and so forth. So this is where it comes from, refined foods. Your whole foods don't do this. Your insulin is designed to work with the fiber. 
It's, it's sort of a sustained release mechanism. Okay, so it, when the insulin goes in, it just doesn't take the sugar and rob it right out or take it right out. It has to kind of draw it out from the insulin or from the fiber. So it works, it's, it's designed to work that way. But now you start removing it, re refining your foods, and it's not there. It doesn't know you don't have the insulin or the fiber in there. Produces the same amount of insulin, and you start getting all of these blood sugar levels, crazy levels. So here is a very interesting um, slide, and it's talking about um, cow milk, okay? And these are uh, direct um, health concerns for children using cow's milk. Allergies, iron deficiency anemia, and that's a B12 deficiency, by the way. Iron deficiency anemia, that's the ones using milk. Lower intelligence, milk sensitivity, early atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries, juvenile diabetes, acne, rheumatoid arthritis, dental decay, and infections. This is, uh, I consider, the saddest slide I have, and this course is in reference to the United States. But 521 children were tested for antibodies to cow's milk of being peptides. So, the uh, 521 children were tested to see if they were allergic to the protein that's in milk. So uh, see if they were allergic to milk. 142 of those children had recent onset type 1 diabetes, juvenile diabetes. 100% of the diabetics were positive for antibodies to peptides. So 100% of the type 1 diabetics of those children were allergic to milk. Only 3% of the other children were positive. Their levels were much lower. So this doctor, researcher, was excited. He said, we may have to under, uh, uncovered a wonderful strategy to prevent type 1 diabetes. If we are right, it may be the beginning of the end of the terrible disease, said this study's author. Well, it didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Nothing changed. Type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes is still in increase. Well, what is it? The protein that uh, the body is reacting to is almost identical to the protein that's on the pancreas. So when the body builds antibodies, and what those antibodies do is when that protein is present, they attack it and destroy it, okay, um, to keep it from you getting food allergies out of it. It doesn't discern between that and the presence of the pancreas. So it attacks its own pancreas and destroys it. Blood sugar or sugar um, weakens the immune system. So that makes us susceptible to cancer. It makes us susceptible to a lot of things, okay? So um, teaspoons of sugar, zero teaspoons of sugar, a killer T cell, um, a white blood cell can kill 14 bacteria before it dies. But if you eat six teaspoons, it can only kill 10. If you eat 12 teaspoons of sugar, it can kill 5.5. .5. Eat 18, can kill two. Eat 24, it can kill one. So sugar weakens our immune system from, uh, from defending our body against disease. So it's, you know, sometimes you could sit next to somebody and they have a cold and you don't get it. Sometimes you sit next to somebody and they have a cold and 15, 20 minutes later you feel it coming on. This depends on where your immune system is. Here are cancers directly related to uh, the consumption of sugar. Colon, rectal, breast, ovarian, uterine, prostate, kidney, and cancer of the nervous system. Where do we find sugar? Okay. A malted milk, 12 ounces, is 42 teaspoons of sugar. Soft drinks, uh, they can be as high as 16 teaspoons of sugar in 12 ounces. And then all the others. So we uh, uh, Canadians like their soft drinks too. So where's sugar? Here's some examples. Um, Americans consume 547 sodas a year. I didn't get the statistics for Canada, but th they like soda too. There's an average of 16 teaspoons in each can. 
So multiply that if you want to get out your electronic devices. So here we go. A hot cocoa mix is 82% sugar. Coffee made is 65% sugar. Shake and bake barbecue style is 51% sugar. Heinz ketchup is 30%. So basically any ketchup, this is the formula for making ketchup, it's gotta be 30 to 33% sugar, okay? So that means every tablespoon of ketchup is one teaspoon of sugar. Hamburger helper, 23%, cool whip, 21%, chocolate cake, 15 teaspoons per serving, uh, one cup of frozen yogurt, 12 teaspoons, and jello is 83% sugar. Six teaspoons of sugar will lower the white blood cell's ability to fight pathogens by 25%. 24 teaspoons will lower the ability to fight disease by 92%. That's equivalent to one piece of pie or soda. So let's consider calories. So calories is what the body has to deal with. All right, so um, more calories, the more insulin is needed to deal with it. So if you're consuming a lot of calories, and you're not doing anything with their calories, then your pancreas, your body has to do it for you, okay? So here's an example of two chicken nuggets, which is 100 calories. And I have to admit to you, I've never seen a chicken nugget. When I used to eat at McDonald's, which was 40, 45 years ago, they didn't have chicken nuggets. So I don't know what a chicken nugget is, but I assume it's not very big, okay? Just two of those is 100 calories. I'm guessing it comes in probably a 10 in a serving or 20 in a serving. So 500 to 1,000 calories plus the ketchup that's put on it. Or one and one quarter cups of vegetable lentil soup. Both those are 100 calories. So when you go to think about sitting down and eating and controlling your calories, What's in the vegetable lentil soup is full of nutrition, see? It's full of fiber, full of things that are completely opposite of uh, the chicken nuggets. It's going to give you a feeling of what we call satiety, satiety, satisfaction. You're going to eat, if you sat down to eat, you know, I don't know how many chicken nuggets it would take to get full. But you would eat chicken nuggets, and then you would eat french fries, and then you'd have a Coke. So you can, can you, you can start to get in your mind how many calories you're pulling in. And then really there's nothing backing there, so in, so in uh, two or three hours you're hungry again. So now you're going to start snacking on something else. But the vegetable lentil soup is going to fill you up. It's full of fiber. It's full of nutrient. It's going to satisfy that, that satiety. You're going to feel full and satisfied because of the nutrient content in the water and the fiber and far less calories. Here is 800 calories, six small baked potatoes or one cup of cashews. Now, these are raw cashews, right? So um, what if they were roasted, because they're usually roasted in oil and salted, and so you're going to sit down and watch TV and grab a bag of cashews. You're going to limit yourself on one cup. You're probably getting a thousand calories in a cup. Now, how many of those uh, baked potatoes are you going to sit down to eat? I had potatoes for lunch. They were this big. Okay? I ate three of them. Three potatoes that big, plus salad and some bread and so forth. Now, how many of those baked potatoes you're going to sit down and eat. One, two, okay. So you're only getting maybe 200 calories. Okay, so it's going to satisfy you. So the, and what I'm trying to convey to you is you can get a handle on these calories that you're consuming, get away from processed foods, get back to the more natural foods, and you will get nutrient, you will get less calories, and you'll have less need of metformin or insulin or whatever you're dealing with as far as your diabetes. Here is two fig newtons or one small cantaloupe. Both 140 calories. Now I often, if my wife is 
running around someplace and not home and it's time for me to eat, I'll grab a cantaloupe, but I won't eat more than a half of it. That and some beans and some bread, I'll just something very simple. I'll be more than satisfied. But I'm only getting 70 calories from the cantaloupe. Now if I was hungry and you gave me a package of fig newtons, two would not be my end game. Okay? Now I haven't eaten fig newtons again in 40 some years, but there, there's nothing there to, to restrict you. It doesn't fill you. And actually fig newtons are not real. They're not real figs. Okay. Um, I have a little uh, uh, um, story of a gentleman from Maine who's a science teacher. Okay. And he did a science experiment for his students uh, 30 years ago. He just retired. And what he did is he took a Twinkie and he, you know what a hostess Twinkie is? Yeah. Okay. Took a hostess Twinkie in his package and pinned it on the chalkboard. And the students were supposed to record its deterioration. Okay. So he took that down 30 years later and it was still edible. Okay. 15 years into the experiment, they put two fig newtons up in a plastic bag and took them down 15 years later. Still the same when it went up there. That's artificial food. That your body doesn't know what to do with. It's not made for things that are artificial. It's made for things that deteriorate very quickly. The quicker a food deteriorates, the more nutrition is available to your body. If it can sit on a shelf for a year or two years or five years or 15 years or 30 years, body can't get it out. All you're going to get out of there is sugar. Okay, here is four ounces of gummy bears or a two pound pineapple. Now, I, I've never eaten a gummy bear, I have to admit, but I'm assuming it's not much, okay? I don't think four ounces has to be much. But that's 450 calories. Now, how many pineapples are you going to sit down to eat? You're going to eat a whole pineapple? <laughs> I doubt if you can eat a half a pineapple. <laughs> okay? there, God, God has put restrictors in whole foods. It restricts us from eating too many calories and supplies us with the max amount of nutrition. But when we get away from whole foods or complex foods, then we're subject to thousands of calories. Uh, you know, uh, uh, four ounces of gummy bears just can't be much. I think if you sat down and started eating gummy bears, you'd be consuming a thousand calories in no time. Plus all the artificial color and, and preservatives and whatever else is in that, okay? So this is where you, you get away. This is how we overdo ourselves. Um, and I, I think that one thing you re a practice you really have got to get away from is having um, a treat at the end of the meal. Those cakes, those candies, those type of things. Man, that's, 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 you should be satisfied with what you've eaten. Um, and a good practice is to leave a table a little hungry. Get up, go wash your plate, go away from the table. It'll keep you from overeating. So we're going to look at 200 calories, all right? 200 calories, an example of 200 calories. Um, one small bag of potato chips or one and three quarter pounds of celery. Anybody here going to sit down and eat one and three quarter pounds of celery? No. no, maybe one or two sticks, right? Okay. A lot of fiber, a lot of good stuff, good nutrition, diuretic, all kinds of things. Very good food, okay? God put restrictors in Whole Foods. How many little bags of potato chips could you sit down and eat? See, there's no restriction here. There's nothing to keep you from eating too many calories. Here is four or eight Hershey Kisses. Familiar with Hershey Kisses, right? Those chocolate, those I have eaten. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I could sit down and eat a bag of those almost. So eight Hershey Kisses is 200 calories, or one and three quarter pounds of sweet peppers. Are, are you getting the idea? Well, if you were hungry and you could grab a pepper and chew on it, 
instead of grabbing Hershey Kisses. Uh, you're not going to eat more than one pepper. But you're going to eat a half a bag or eight or 10 or 12 or 14 Hershey Kisses. Here's one small bag of pretzels, which they hand out in United Flights. <laughs> or one and three quarter pounds of broccoli. Broccoli is 128 calories per pound. But broccoli is high in carbohydrates. It's high in mineral. It's high in vitamin. It's high in protein. It's more protein than steak. High in nutrition. In fact, each year we spend over $30 million on diet products and weight loss programs. Two and a half times what we spend on fitness and health. There are pills, drinks, bars, you can lose weight while you sleep, while you watch TV, and while eating everything you want, always pushing the newest way to stay thin without exercise. Some people, however, feel that they have tried everything and see only one remaining option as their last hope for health. I'm not only 80% of people don't have to take insulin anymore after this, plus some have hypertension, hopefully correct that, lose my weight. Is my high blood pressure. Yeah. This is Bruce Howell. In a few minutes, his stomach will be surgically reduced to the size of a small apple in a gastric bypass operation. People with hypertension who are obese, about 75% of them will get rid of their hypertensive medications. Doctors Adam Naiman and Carl Geisler will be performing the operation. Together they have done more than 500 gastric bypass surgeries, and with their tandem technique, they are setting the industry standard, completing the procedure in less than 30 minutes, and sending patients home the following day. We have established now that the only procedure that really cures diabetes is obesity surgery. Went blind for a week. Just went completely blind. One day out of the you went blind. I went to work. Um, got to work, drove to work that night, got to work there, couldn't read the charts, and I had to call my supervisor and tell her I couldn't work because I couldn't see what I was doing, and I called my wife and had to get a ride to work to pick me up and take me home. And then once I stopped drinking the um, nights, I was just got my sugar back down. My, I was fortunate that my eyesight came back and didn't do that much damage to them at that time. I, I think it's human nature to seek a drastic solution only when you're faced with a drastic problem. Well, I've done three or four of those a day. Three or four, because this, this is a half gallon. So that means you were drinking probably about two gallons, of, two gallons of soda a day. It wasn't that easy for a two week time. We'd buy like 52 liters of soda. 50, 52 liters every two weeks. <laughs> and then probably even having to pick him up a couple of days. He drinks more than I do. Yeah. I go through about one of those a day. Yeah. Uh, if somebody went through three or four, two liters. A lot of us don't realize the uh, social stigma that these people face on a, on a daily basis. So did you notice uh, that's a gastric bypass surgery. We're going to reduce the stomach to the size of a small apple. So all you can eat at one time is a small apple. They're going to, usually they'll take the duodenum, which is uh, first part of your small intestinal tract. It's where 
90% of all of your absorption of your nutrition is and cut it in half and attach it to that little small stomach now. So you're, they're making you malnourished and you're going to cure your diabetes. Yeah. Now, if you don't want to go to such a drastic measure, on average, our uh, type 2 diabetics, or blood sugar is normal in four days, on average. It's just a change in diet and lifestyle. You can do it at home. You do not have to go to such extremities. It's very easily done. Again, your, your fats intake, increasing your intake of fruits and vegetables, your amount of exercise, increasing the floor in your intestinal tract, all these things. You'll get, you can nip it in the bud very quickly, very quickly. We've had people who have been taking insulin for 30 years. Now that individual took six weeks, but they are also had quadruple bypass surgery and were on all kinds of medication. Six weeks, completely no medication at all. Okay, taken insulin for 30 years. Now still blind, couldn't, already gone blind, but that couldn't have been restored. But to this day, which has been um, 11 years, still no medication. You can do it, it's very easily done. Very easily done. Sugar, sugar, sugar. Uh, Dr. Edgar Howe says that sugar, Okay, sugar um, should be outlawed as a poison instead of considered a food. Today, the average Canadian, I have to turn my volume down here. So today, the average Canadian eats 26 teaspoons of sugar a day. That's 110 grams a year, or 88 pounds for every man, woman, and child in this country. Uh, I, I know some individuals here that don't eat any sugar at all. That, that means somebody, maybe in this room, is eating more than the average. Okay, the study showed that sugar consumption was lowest among women aged 77 and, and over at 20 teaspoons a day. And the highest sugar consumption was among teenagers, boys ages 14 to 18, at 41 teaspoons a day, or 137 and a half pounds of sugar a year. That's actually more than the average, uh, or almost as high as the average in the United States. Average in the United States is 149 teaspoons of sugar a year, or 149 pounds, I should say. This is a really interesting study. So we were um, earlier talking about anxiety and, and uh, uh, our social life. This is a very interesting study. It's called the Tidewater Study. It was from, it was from a juvenile um, uh, 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 penitentiary. Uh, um, they, are, they were violent crime, juvenile violent crime penitentiary, okay? And what they did was is they went in and they took out all, emptied all the vending machines. So they could not get any candies, any sugars, okay? They replaced uh, apples, oranges, and so forth in the vending machines. They were not allowed to get any of that food from home. No cakes, no candies, nothing sugar related, okay? And in a very short period of time, this is what happened. 82% reduction in assaults, 77% reduction in thefts, 65% reduction in malicious horseplay, and a 55% reduction in refusal to obey orders. Can you ha imagine what would happen to society if we were to take sugar out? You know, it's there. Uh, I know in, in the United States we've had instances where individuals gone up in towers and shooting people and so forth. Generally, those people's diets before this takes place is high sugar and high caffeine. That's the end.